Tim Tate from the University of California at Irvine will tell us about life post Higgs. And it works. So I wanted to start by saying that it's really a pleasure to be here uh, giving this talk today. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, and to get the two questions that I know are in everybody's mind out of the way. Uh, yes, Rocky, I do own a suit. And this animal is an anteater. Uh, so here's a brief outline. Uh, I'm going to be hopefully a little more focused, uh, a little less broad than some of the previous talks. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the discovery of the Higgs, uh, where we stand today, and then what it sort of suggests we might be doing next as particle physicists. So uh, Florencia actually showed uh, at least this image, and I think this one too. Uh, it's very, very exciting. This is the second <laughs> particle I've seen discovered during my career, uh, and certainly the one that I uh, was, had much greater doubt was actually going to be discovered. Uh, Florencia also showed these very nice images. I think these are wonderful PR. Uh, I just chose a smattering of them. This is the Higgs to Gamma Gamma, where we see a year and a half compressed into a few seconds. Uh, and we see that in the invariant mass of the two photons in the event, uh, the object that would correspond to the mass of a particle uh, were it decaying into them, there is a clear bump at about 125 GeV. We also see it uh, in Higgs to ZZ. Uh, I apologize that my skills are not, uh, my skills at manipulating animated GIFs are not quite up to Florencia's standards. Uh, this, these excesses appear precisely in the channels that we use to look for the LHC Higgs. If there was a Higgs, this is where we would expect to see it. Uh, in this case, just because we have better control over the background, uh, and here because the Higgs really does like to couple uh, to weak bosons. Uh, so let's say a little bit about why this is important. Uh, this is the table of elementary particles. It's sort of like the periodic table of the elements, but for particle physicists. Um, the Higgs discovery is, I think, as Florencia really conveyed very well, an amazing triumph of accelerator and detector design and operation, experimental search techniques, and theoretical predictions. Uh, the Higgs is the last missing ingredient in the standard model of particle physics. So as of now, we've actually found all the particles that we knew were supposed to be there. Uh, and so we have to think about how to update this table Maybe the Higgs is a force carrier. I, I think it's actually debatable. Uh, but the Higgs itself is a remnant of the construction that preserves gauge invariance. Uh, and this gauge invariance is necessary for us to have a consistent description of the electroweak interactions. So until we found the Higgs, we knew there were W and Z bosons. We knew that they were massive. But we knew that there was something missing. And we'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, Florentia also mentioned in going through the history that 125 GeV is the right place for us to discover the Higgs. Uh, this is based on the precision measurements uh, of the properties of the Z bosons by LEP. I apologize that this is not that easy to see, but uh, LEP was colliding electrons and positrons, producing Z bosons, and then watching them decay into various fermions. Uh, the result is a really a fabulous set of measurements. If you, and the actual individual entries on this table are not very important. Uh, but what is staggering is the fact that the measurements are done at the per mil level, 
And they're sensitive enough that we can actually see the effect of virtual Higgs bosons coupling to the Z boson, uh, as illustrated in this graph. Combining that data together, uh, we get a plot that, again, Florencia showed, and that I suspect we're going to stop seeing in particle physics talks uh, relatively soon, which is going to be kind of a, at least a change for me. Uh, it shows the, the, how this fit predicts the mass of the Higgs boson, and we see that it favored masses between about 50 and 150 GeV, depending on how much we're, allowed, we're willing to let the delta chi squared change. Uh, this plot was made actually a little bit more recently than the one Florencia showed. And at that time, the LHC and LEP together had already excluded almost everything except where we actually found the Higgs. Um, the Higgs is really important in the standard model. It was not just something that we thought would be nice if it were there. We really needed it. Uh, it's a trick, ultimately. It's a theoretical trick to give us masses which are consistent with the gauge symmetry uh, that we know has to be there to describe W and Z interactions. But this gauge symmetry insists that the masses of those particles are zero. And the trick is actually really simple. We know that we can write down interacting theories. We can, we can write down interactions for these particles that preserve the gauge symmetry. In fact, the gauge symmetry actually demands that we write down interactions. Uh, then what we do, though, is arrange for the Higgs field to be turned on even in empty space. And that spontaneously breaks the symmetry in the vacuum. <coughs> so because the particles interact with this field, when they move through this background, they bump into it. It slows them down, and it gives the impression that they have masses. And this is cartooned over here, where we see a region of space, the sort of, I have to confess, I don't know what that color is. Uh, the color in the background is showing that the Higgs is turned on. And uh, we have various particles moving through the region of space. The photon doesn't have any couple, couplings to the Higgs, or at least it has only very special ones. Uh, it actually moves through unimpeded. Therefore, the fact that it's massless is revealed. The electron has small couplings to the Higgs, so it bounces around a little bit, and it takes a while for the electron to actually get to the other side. The electron is moving slower than the speed of light as a result. The W boson has very strong couplings to the Higgs, and it bounces around on its way through the field until it ultimately uh, gets to the other side, giving it a large mass. So when we look for the Higgs boson, what we're actually looking for is the only tangible sign, or at least the easiest tangible sign to see, that this field is actually there. Because every quantum field has uh, quantized waves that travel through it, which we call particles. Uh, and so finding those particles tell us, actually, this is really a, a field that exists. More diagrams you can't see. Uh, the Higgs is important to, uh, for other reasons as well. Uh, to speak theorist a little bit, uh, but I promise I'll explain what it means, the Higgs UV completes the standard model. So what these diagrams that you can't see actually indicate are W bosons, which are scattering in all the ways they would do in the standard model without the Higgs. So we have two Ws coming in. They form, say, a Z boson, and then they go out again. We can also exchange the Z this way. There's a contact interaction. And if there is a Higgs boson, we can also exchange the Higgs boson in this way uh, as well. So if we just calculate the three graphs we have here without including the Higgs graph, we get a cross-section that grows with energy. So this is cartooned here. We see the energy of these incoming particles. And the cross-section is growing actually like E squared. At some point, this result becomes inconsistent with quantum mechanics because the probability of scattering, or in other words, of something happening, becomes bigger than 100%. And this is a clear sign that there's something wrong with our theory. Something is missing. And it tells us that the standard model without the Higgs cannot be the complete story up to arbitrarily high energies. When I include the Higgs graph, everything looks much, much better. I get a curve that looks like the blue curve. So at very, very low energies, it seems to grow because we can't quite see that the Higgs is there yet. But at some point, when we get to energies around the Higgs mass, it turns over and it actually falls, completely consistently with quantum mechanics. Um, so what we say here is that this theory now gives me perfectly sensible predictions, even at high energies or in the ultraviolet. So we say that this is a complete theory in the ultraviolet. And the Higgs, therefore, UV completes the standard model. Um, now, this is amazing in terms of its success. Uh, it's extraordinary, and it actually makes me feel kind of uncomfortable. Up until now, we knew that there had to be something missing at the TeV energy scale, because we knew that the weak boson scattering amplitudes became too large at that energy. That's what we just saw. But now that we have that missing ingredient in hand, our theories could actually potentially work all the way up until about the Planck scale, where quantum gravity becomes important. So it actually makes you wonder, are we victims of our own success?
For the first time, since we've had a modern understanding of the three fundamental forces that the standard model contains, we have a theory that doesn't actually have any internal tension up to extremely high energies, well beyond the reach of our most ambitious experiments. Uh, now, yesterday, I saw on the monitor outside that there was a tweet. I think this is telling me who made the tweet, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the tweet said, nightmare scenario feared. Find the standard model at the LHC and nothing else. And I have to say that if I were skilled enough, I would be tempted to give this talk entirely in tweets. But that would probably not be very nice for you. <laughs> um, the situation reminds me of an analogous chapter that we've seen uh, in the history of physics already. At the beginning of the 20th century, Lord Kelvin addressed the British Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, what he said is that the beauty and clearness of the dynamical theory, which asserts heat and light to be modes of motion, is at present obscured by two clouds. The first came into existence with the undulatory theory of light and was dealt with by Fresnel and Young. It involved the question, how could the Earth move through an elastic solid, such as the luminiferous ether? Try to say that fast, I had to practice. Uh, the second is the Maxwell-Boltzmann doctrine regarding the partition of energy. And so what Kelvin was expressing here was that all of the, almost all of the physical phenomena of his time could be described by Newton's laws in classical electromagnetism. Uh, E&M actually is much more intimately related to both of these. But there were two experimental results, clouds, to use his analogy, which famously did not quite fit in. Uh, and I have to say, it's a wonderful metaphor, and so it's going to sort of go through the rest of what I'm saying. So Kelvin's clouds, or his two clouds, were what seemed to be an inconsistency in the properties of the luminiferous ether. Uh, so this is the background through which electromagnetic waves were thought to propagate at the time, uh, and the observed spectrum of the thermal radiation from a black body. So today we know that the first of these was a hint that led to Einstein's theory of special relativity. The second was the initial manifestation of quantum mechanics. So both of these small clouds, where we didn't quite have the right de description to see what we were seeing with experiments, actually eventually grew to redefine and subsume everything that we thought we knew. Now we think that these are actually the defining features, and of course, maybe someday we'll find something to replace them too. So I think it's reasonable at this point to ask what clouds we're seeing. Uh, these are the clouds that I see at Corona del Mar uh, Beach, which is close to Irvine. And I think it actually, this is the picture that more or less works to describe what we see. Uh, but first, we should ask ourselves, how bright is the sky? Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you're chuckling. <laughs> um, obviously, I want not to repeat this moment of history uh, <laughs> in particle physics. Uh, and the question is really, uh, we should take stock in how solid our belief is that we've actually found the Higgs boson. If we haven't found what we need to complete the standard model, then whatever we found is going to suggest a theory that will break down at some energy scale, and, and where exactly is going to depend on how well it does the job of uh, taming those scattering amplitudes that we saw were growing earlier. Uh, but in other words, is this actually the Higgs boson, or is it just something that kind of looks like it? This is an easy question for us to answer now. Well, easy. <laughs> This is an easy question for us to frame now, because the standard model predicts every property that the Higgs should have very precisely as a function of its mass. And now we know the mass. So we can ask how the Higgs couples to all the other particles that we know about, and we can check to see if these couplings match up with our expectations. And obviously, any significant deviation is a sign that we haven't completed the standard model after all. So these are some orthogonal uh, takes on some of the results that Florencia showed concerning the couplings. Uh, and you know, I corrected myself on the previous slide because extracting the Higgs properties is actually a challenge. It's not at all an easy thing to do, uh, but we're making progress and we know how to make more. So there are many different production channels combined with different decay modes. Uh, what these authors have done, this is the S-fitter collaboration, has actually been to parameterize the coupling of Higgs to X as whatever the Higgs coupling to X should be in the standard model times one plus delta X. So for every particle in the standard model, x equals something, and there's a delta that tells me how, well, um, tells me how much it differs, the Higgs coupling to that particle differs from the standard model prediction. Uh, so this was done actually as a global fit. It didn't try to divide things up by channel. It put them all together and said, what does the data tell me overall in this language? And I should mention that there are many other groups that do similar fits and find similar results. And in fact, Florencia showed us that the experimental collaborations also have their own way of doing these things. So this particular fit uh, is shown in three sections. These gray lines divide three sections, so they're actually three different uh, 
assumptions that, that go into the fit. The red shows what the standard model expectation is. So that's always living with a central value at zero because the standard model predicts the standard model. Uh, but it has an uncertainty, and the uncertainty is really the important thing here. Uh, it tells us, given what we've already measured in other places, how well do we actually know uh, what this value should be. Then the blue, the dark blue and the light blue uh, data uh, points actually show what you get by using the data we have at hand now. And uh, by now, I mean when this preprint arrived. Uh, so you see that these scatter around a little bit. They're all sort of roughly consistent, uh, with a few exceptions, which actually have, have actually I have to confess, have moved back towards uh, consistent uh, since this plot was made. But you see that they scatter around, and they're roughly in agreement at, say, the 50% level. And a lot of them are actually in much better agreement than that, of course. The difference between the dark blue and the light blue is that uh, in the light blue, they also allow the Higgs coupling to photons to vary independently from its coupling to top quarks and W bosons. And then these three panels represent the different assumptions they can make. So in the first one, they just assume that all these couplings change by the same amount. So delta is the same for everybody, and they call that delta H. So it's not actually Higgs coupling to Higgs. It's an abuse of the notation. It's just Higgs coupling to everybody. And you see that actually it looks like uh, this measurement is telling us that that seems to be true at sort of uh, the 20% level or so. Uh, and certainly within error bars, it looks quite consistent with what we would think the standard model would predict. The second region shows something that Florencia also sh already showed us. This is the coupling to vector bosons versus the coupling to fermions. So now we've split it into two different couplings and let those vary together. We get uh, these two results, which again look very consistent. And then finally, the last panel uh, is where I let all the couplings vary independently. And it's only at that point that it makes sense to talk about the gamma-gamma coupling uh, varying as well, and so you don't see any light blue points over here. So, so far, it looks consistent with the Higgs, but this is a very rough statement. It's sort of a few tens of percent level statement. Uh, and of course, if we assume there are no large deviations from the standard model, we can make a forecast for how well we will be able to measure these couplings in the future, depending on what we have available to do it. So uh, again, these are more predictions by the same group. Uh, we've also got delta H separated from varying everybody. I didn't put the gray lines here. Uh, and so the assumptions as I go down are the blue uh, points are what I would get by running the LHC. And this is, I think, what Florencia said we could expect in 2030 or so. The light blue points are a 250 GeV linear collider, so an E plus E minus collider. Down here, this is actually a 500 uh, GeV linear collider, so the two differ by what energy they assume the linear collider would have. Uh, but of course, the linear collider is also not going to arrive tomorrow. So if we do build one, uh, most likely we'll be combining it with some amount of LHC data. In fact, we certainly will be combining it with some amount of LHC data. They've assumed that we're going to combine it with all of this LHC data. Uh, and that's where we get the red points. And the yellow points just relax some of the assumptions that the change in the top coupling is related to the change in the charm coupling. And you can see that the LHC with a large data set gets something between, I think it would be more fair to say 5 to 20% for most of these couplings. Uh, the high energy E plus E minus collider can actually improve the precision to a few percent, and it allows you to relax some of the key assumptions, like that these couplings are related to each other. So let's talk about some real clouds. Or in other words, the sky is pretty bright and it's getting brighter, I would say. Uh, we had a very nice presentation in the beginning of this session about neutrinos. Um, but just to reiterate some of the important questions that remain, some of the clouds that we see that we don't understand. The standard model has three generations of fermions. Each one has two quarks and two leptons. Uh, there's a huge variation in the masses of the fermions. It ranges over many orders of magnitude. The fermions mix together to different degrees. We really have no understanding why there are three generations. We don't know why we have the pattern of masses that's very hierarchical that we see. We don't know by how much, uh, we don't know why they mix to the degree that they do, which looks very different in the quark sector, sector and the lepton sector. This is sort of a fun graphic image that kind of illustrates it. It doesn't really do justice to the neutrinos, but since you probably can't see those dots, you can't tell. Um, another related question is why does the strong force seem to conserve uh, CP? Uh, we had very nice lectures yesterday in the session uh, where there was speeches by the uh, Sakurai Prize winners about Pesci-Quinn symmetry. It, maybe this is a hint that we need this symmetry and the axions that would go with it. 
If there is some kind of dynamics that controls flavor, it could reveal itself as an unexpected source of, uh, unexpected kind of flavor violation, which is not captured by the way the standard model has to describe a mixing. And that's why it's very important that we're doing these experiments to overconstrain the flavor system uh, and see whether or not we can actually show a breakdown of the standard model. Uh, and again, to remind us, neutrino masses are particularly mysterious because we don't know if neutrinos are their own antiparticles. And that's really the reason why we don't have a new theory of the standard model that includes neutrino masses. We have two choices, and we don't know which one to choose. So there are further things we don't understand. If we look at larger scales, the universe has big surprises in it. Uh, supernova get dimmer faster than one would anticipate, indicating that the expansion of the universe is faster than expected. So this is a plot as a function of the redshift as to the uh, distance modulus of the of a various supernova. This is a large data set. You can see that there's a, a line here that describes it. Um, older versions of this plot had another line that showed you what you would have if there were no dark energy that would sort of go down like this. And you would see that these data are clearly indicating that there is dark energy in the universe. Um, many questions about that remain. We don't know why the energy scale of the dark energy seems to be so tiny compared to the other energy scales in particle physics. It just, it's really sort of puzzling that dark energy would take such a tiny value. We don't know if, if dark energy is actually a dynamical feature, like in a model of quintessence, which could evolve in time, or is it really just a cosmological constant that we can measure over and over again uh, and we'll always get the same answer. Now, refined measurements can tell, and so what this plot is showing it's actually showing the amount of matter in the universe on the x-axis, but on the y-axis, it's showing this parameter w that tells me how the cosmological constant, <coughs> being that it is not constant by assumption here, uh, is evolving with time. Or in other words, how, much, how dark energy evolves with time. Negative 1 would be consistent with a cosmological constant. We already have actually pretty impressive measurements, I would say, by putting various sources together, including the supernova. Uh, they're consistent with it being a constant, but they still allow for a large amount of uh, change. And of course, future measurements, uh, like just improving the statistics on these plots, especially allowing us to go out to higher redshifts where we have more lever arm, can actually tell. They can help us refine this picture and really either zero in to knowing that we have a cosmological constant or measuring how it's changing if, if we don't. Dark energy is not the only dark component of the universe. There's a wide range of evidence that indicates that most of the matter in the universe is actually something that we haven't seen yet, something else that has to go in our table of particles. Uh, a few of the famous ones are the rotation curves of galaxies or motion in clusters. There's the power spectrum in the CMB, and Planck has very recently weighed in. It gives us really fabulously precise measurements. This is now in the plane of the amount of matter in the universe compared to the amount of dark energy. And we see that we're zeroing in on a very uh, small region here that has a large amount of matter, most of which cannot be baryons. Uh, there's the distribution of large scale structure that indicates that without having something else to help galaxies form, we wouldn't see a universe like the one we have. So nothing in the standard model has the right properties to explain these observations, and that argues that we need something else. But what is that something? What are its mass and spin? Uh, is it electroweakly charged? Does it interact with the W and C bosons? Does it interact with the Higgs? Maybe we need to have another delta in our, our description. I think you've probably all seen this image of the bullet cluster, which is cute. It just shows that the uh, amount of ordinary matter, which is seen, uh, that's gas, that's seen by uh, X-ray emission in the pink, is distinct. And the, these, are, these are two galaxy clusters that have just sort of just passed collision, uh, is distinct from the centers of the actual matter density, which we can get from weak lensing. Uh, this I couldn't resist putting in. It shows that you can actually buy dark matter. It costs $59.99 for 20 servings, not including delivery. Um, what I didn't write here is that it comes in three flavors, so maybe that's also telling us something we should know. Uh, we have lots of ways to search for dark matter. Um, I, right now, everything we see about dark matter basically is through its interaction via, gravitational, uh, by, by the gravitational force. The real question then is, does it have some other kind of interaction with ordinary matter? I already raised the possibility that it might interact electroweakly. Um, we have good reasons to think that it might have much stronger coupling than gravitational. Uh, so if it has a strong enough interaction, it will naturally be produced at early times when the universe is dense and hot, and then it'll freeze out to its current density. So one way of understanding why there is dark matter in the universe would be based on uh, its interactions with ordinary matter. 
And in this picture, the abundance of dark matter is controlled by the rate that it annihilates into ordinary matter. So we have another invisible diagram here that shows two dark matter particles inter, uh, annihilating and producing two standard model particles. This is the interaction, actually, that would control the amount of dark matter we would have in this picture. So can we observe such an annihilation today? This is actually uh, a plot that was taken, uh, that was produced by the Fermi-Lat collaboration. Um, they're looking at gamma rays, in this case coming from uh, dwarf galaxies that are close to the Milky Way. Uh, and then they use the fact that they don't see dark matter in those galaxies, and we have a pretty good idea that there must be dark matter in those galaxies, because we wouldn't understand the way the stars we see in those galaxies are moving unless there were. So the fact that they don't see any gamma rays being produced by dark matter annihilations allow them to put a bound as to how much dark matter is allowed to annihilate into various particles like bottom quarks, taus, muons, or W bosons. And of course, I could make a different line for every particle in the standard model. So as a function of the dark matter mass, they put a limit. This is actually combining, uh, I think it's 10 of these dwarf spheroidal galaxies together. Uh, to have one of these channels give me just enough dark matter annihilation to explain the amount of dark matter I see. I should be aiming for this dashed line that goes across. Uh, and we see that actually in a few of these channels they're managing to make it. So they're putting a constraint that if dark matter does annihilate entirely into this type of particle, uh, we know that, that it's, you know, it's, the rate of its annihilation is actually restricted to be smaller than what we would need to explain the amount of dark matter uh, in the universe. Uh, we can look for dark matter in other ways, too. The motion of our own galaxy suggests that there should be substantial dark matter right here around us. Uh, if it interacts with ordinary matter, it's possible that we could catch some of these particles and see them bumping into us, and by us I just mean ordinary matter. Uh, so this is called the direct search for dark matter. It uses very sensitive detectors with heavy shielding. They look for a handful of dark matter scattering events. So the idea is dark matter comes in, it doesn't interact with the shield, it, it uh, nudges one of the nuclei in the target, and then leaves, and then when it leaves, it also doesn't uh, interact with the shield. So it looks like sort of nothing came in and nothing went out, but this nucleus just decided that something bumped into it. And we read out a signal related to how it was actually perturbed. So this is a very rich field that has a lot of different kinds of experiments in it. Uh, these are bounds that are made by the Xenon collaboration. Uh, they are so, sort of currently leading the way for WIMP masses around 100 GeV or so. Uh, there's, um, there's a related experiment called LUX, which is going to tell us something by the end of the year, uh, and it's got sort of a larger fiducial target, so uh, it should extend, expand on this picture a little bit. Just a, I think actually just yesterday, CDMS, which is a germanium-based experiment, looked at its silicon detectors, and they actually found that they had a few events more than they expected, so they're actually looking at uh, a region where they might even be seeing dark matter, and of course this is extremely exciting. Uh, we have to see, we have to wait and see how things go. It's not enough events that they or anybody else is claiming that we're actually seeing dark matter. There's also a mystery here because uh, this is sort of a blow up of the region up here. We actually see that the region they favor is, that, is very mildly excluded by the xenon experiment already. So this might be an indication that the vanilla dark matter properties they assumed when they made this plot um, are just not actually true. And finally, we can go back to the LHC and we can try to produce dark matter from collisions of ordinary matter at high energies. Uh, if dark matter interacts with quarks or gluons, we can look for a process where the dark matter is produced with some extra radiation. So this has a quark coming in, a gluon comes in and then splits into an anti-quark, which gets together with a quark and produces a pair of dark matter particles. And in the same time, it radiates another quark. So what we see is two dark matter particles that don't interact with the detector and look like nothing. Uh, recoiling against a jet of hadrons that we can see. So this type of event is revealed by an imbalance in the momentum in the transverse direction. Um, yeah. So if we trace the limits on the parameter space of direct detection, so this is again the direct detection, so this is the sc scattering cross-section with nuclei, with, sorry, with a nucleon, as a function of the WIMP mass. That xenon bound we saw before is the red line here. And what we see is that the LHC is doing a particularly good job of looking for very light dark matter particles. Um, that's not actually that surprising. It's because an experiment like xenon has to, have a, has to see it's one of its xenon nuclei get enough momentum that we actually notice that it's moving. Um, if the dark matter is very light, it doesn't carry very much momentum. It's non-relativistic. Its momentum is mv. Uh, so 
if it doesn't have enough momentum, then it can't nudge a xenon nucleus enough to actually see it. But at the LHC, we're not actually trying to see the dark matter doing anything except be there. If the dark matter is lighter, it just means we get to produce more of it, and the LHC continues to do a good job even at very low masses. So actually, it occurred to me at this point that we may be in a situation where we're seeing more clouds than sky, uh, which I think is a wonderful situation to be in. Uh, to finish up with some outlook, the discovery of the Higgs completes the standard model. It's a triumph of modern physics. The theory produ uh, predicted it. The experiments found it. For the first time since understanding the basic picture of the electroweak interaction, we have an experimentally tested theory that may be able to actually dictate physics up to the Planck scale. Uh, but there's still a huge amount to do. We need to verify that the Higgs we found is indeed the particle we've been looking for. If we see a deviation, it definitely means that the standard model is not the whole story. And it would suggest that we don't actually have a theory that we can reliably extrapolate to high energies. So we'll actually get an indication as to where we can expect to be guaranteed to find new physics again. And in addition, there are lots more dark clouds that loom on the horizon. The flavor structure of the standard model remains mysterious. We found that most of our universe is composed of dark components that we really don't know very much about. And the real question is, are these just small details to fill in, a couple new particles, maybe a constant to measure? Or actually, are these paradigm shifting changes uh, like the ones that we saw 100 years ago? Either way, the Higgs is only the beginning of the story. I just wanted to finish with an apology. Um, basically, there are lots of good theoretical reasons that argue that there should be physics beyond the standard model. And maybe it would have been more natural for me to talk about them. But I just found these experimental clouds were so compelling that I couldn't resist focusing on them. Uh, and so I apologize for that. And I'd be happy to talk about any or all of these offline. Thank you. We have time for questions for uh, both Tim and Flor from uh, Florencia. If you have a question, please approach a microphone. A question for Tim. In the beginning of your talk, you showed us a slide to help us understand why Higgs gives particles mass. And the idea is that a, a moving particle bumps into this field or the Higgs and it slows it down. Now the problem with that is that it violates several of Newton's laws <laughs> and it doesn't tell us why a particle, if it's not moving, still has mass because if it's in a gravitational field, it'll feel a force, even though not moving. That's right. Um, it's maybe less of a metaphor than Newton's laws would suggest because you have to remember that really what we're dealing with is quantum field theory. And quantum field theory tells me that I can only ask what happens at the beginning when I measure the system and at the end when I measure the system. So in some sense, asking what happens in the middle, or you know, asking that each individual collision conserve energy momentum or satisfy Newton's laws, it's not actually meaningful in the framework that we're, we're working with. Um, but it is true that this is a metaphor. Another question? Uh, way back in the back, uh, approach a microphone, please. Uh, my question is uh, about the generation of mass. So I guess that the mass that is generated is the inertial mass of the, of the particle uh, generated by the Higgs mechanism. But we know that particles also have gravitational masses, both active and passive. Um, what does the, if anything, the Higgs mechanism can tell us about that? Or uh, can it shed light on why they should be equal if they are? So I haven't talked at all about gravity, which means I can't really address the second kind of mass, in other words, the gravitational mass. But if I were to implement gravity in a very simple way, uh, then it would be a quantum theory that I'd be able to actually make sense of at low energies. So all of low energy gravity would be a, you know, I'd be able to describe it. At high energies, I wouldn't really be able to make any predictions at all, so we're not going to talk about that. Uh, but at low energies, if I implemented gravity, um, say, straightforwardly, I would find that the mass the Higgs has generated is, in fact, not only the inertial mass, but also the gravitational mass. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one or two more questions uh, for either Tim or Florencia. <laughs> I don't see any more. 
Oh, there is someone approaching microphone. Uh, I have a problem uh, uh, on the dark, dark matter problem. I think that the, the uh, detector, the, there, I think there is a problem in the detector, and not uh, uh, this. I have made, a, I have uh, written a paper and that appeared just today on the archive. And uh, I, I discussed that the uh, uh, triality symmetry of the octonion is important for, for making a uh, uh, selection rule to detect electromagnetic waves. And uh, if that, uh, 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 that so, is, I'm sorry, I have to apologize. I'm not okay. quite uh, hearing everything that you're saying. Okay. Uh, you I, said I, that there's I, a symmetry I, I, that's important. Which symmetry? That is uh, the, if one includes the triality symmetry of the octonions, that is the Dirac particle consists of combination of quaternions. And that makes octonions. And octonions has that specific symmetry, that triality symmetry. And uh, if one includes that uh, selection rule from the triality symmetry, then one could uh, say that the electromagnetic wave can be uh, not detected from the electron on the Earth, the detector on the Earth, but uh, that could be detected in other world. Yeah, so I'm sorry that I'm yeah, okay. not um, quite following everything. I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. Okay, um, is, uh, it is true, we don't know what the selection rule that would require dark matter to be stable is, uh, yeah. but we do need to have some kind of selection rule like that, because otherwise it would decay away and it would not be in the universe today. Yeah, okay. But, uh, okay, let, let's thank all the speakers for very nice talks.